Hello, viewers. I am Susan Gerbeck, and I was an attendee at SciCon 2023 at the Flamingo Casino in Las Vegas in late October 2023. I am releasing a series of videos that are just quick takes. I am not a professional. I don't pretend to be a professional videographer. I am someone who pretty much just pointed their iPhone at the screen and hit record. I am releasing these videos not um, not as something formal, but something informal. So you can see those people who are curious what happened at SciCon and what it's like to attend these amazing conferences like SciCon, which will be held in 2024, last weekend of October in Las Vegas. Uh, please subscribe to the Center for Inquiries YouTube channel. Uh, they start releasing videos about January 2024, and they'll come out every three weeks or so of the talks that happened at SciCon 2023. On this playlist, you will find many videos, uh, just random videos that I recorded, and I'm releasing to you to enjoy and get the feel of what SciCon's like. What you're about to see is a tribute to um, Ken Frazier, who is a friend of mine. Um, his wife or his widow is sitting next to me. That was entirely coincidental. I needed to sit in the front because I did want to record some videos for, for reals. And um, so you will hear her and I kind of, you might hear some noise in the background of her and I and then the rest of the audience. This is a tribute. As I said, you will see this um, eventually on the YouTube channel for PsyCon. Um, Center for Inquiry, it'll be in much better shape than the video I'm putting out right now. But, you know, just keep that in mind. Please leave comments and please like and share. And um, I look forward to meeting you at SciCon 2024. Is to run disclaimers above their daily horoscopes. Kendrick Frazier is editor of Cyclops Journal the Skeptical Inquirer. And most uh, editors do realize that astrology is uh, not scientifically supported, it's not scientific, and uh, uh, they feel somewhat embarrassed about the columns. They know they're quite popular, however, and uh, they're, they're in, not in the job of taking out popular features. But uh, many have relegated them to the comments pages or otherwise uh, de-emphasized them rather than emphasizing them. Hoax or not, Aztecs celebrate with an annual symposium. Believers even memorialize the alleged crash site with a plaque. What's the best thing you could say to the, to the citizens of Aztec about their uh, their place of history? I hope they could find something more interesting and significant and more real to tout for uh, their historical place. And I'd say the same thing to the people in Roswell. I know people who've, who've been essentially wasted 10 to 15 years of their lives and caught up in the UFO subculture. It's, it's sad when that happens. It's, it's hard to get back out of. It's, it's like a cult in some, some ways, or it can be. It's a waste, human waste. So is this complex assemblage uh, of vertically linked balloons and instruments and interesting box kite-like uh, structures that we call radar reflectors made of balsa wood and foil to reflect radar signals so they can track it? There's nothing there scientifically. There's no evidence that has stood the test of time that has shown up and uh, proven to be real.
I covered it for Science News and later wrote about the, uh, the, the creation of this organization. And in fact, I have covered uh, uh, Science News magazine called Challenging Pseudoscience from May 1976. Now, I was quite young back then. I was just a kid. Oh my God, that's a long time ago, isn't it? But that's how I got started. It was a, a mind it's expanding conference, one of the most interesting ones I ever, ever, ever attended. And uh, we went on from there, and I was asked to become editor of uh, what is now the Skeptical Inquirer the very next year. And I just decided to leave Science News at that time for family reasons, to return to the West, and uh, just it was a perfect thing for me, and I, it's been perfect ever since. I'm very privileged to be editor of a magazine that deals with these issues and draws upon the expertise of scientists, scholars, and investigators all over the world and help bring them to fruition in print and in many other ways that the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry helps bring to the public. Recent year's winners have included Natalia Pasternak, Timothy Caulfield, Susan Gerbic, Joe Schwartz, Paul Offit, <laughs> Richard Wiseman, you may have heard some of these people, uh, and the creators of Cosmos, uh, a space time odyssey. Before there was a SciCon, a Center for Inquiry, a Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, a SciCon, or a Skeptical Inquirer, Kendrick Fraser. Was, the editor at, was an editor at Science News. As you saw him explain in the video, he went, on, he went to cover the birth of what this organization would become, the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. They launched their magazine, The Zetech, in 1976, and after two issues, they needed a new editor. They got a pen, thank goodness. And the magazine was soon renamed Skeptical Inquirer, and in his remembrance of Ken, Daniel Loxton wrote recently, Ken may have been the single person most responsible for shaping the global <laughs> skeptical movement. Honoring Ken like this is a pretty daunting responsibility. Uh, it's one I take extremely seriously. Uh, so in order to do right by Ken, I'm gonna do what anyone who knows me will tell you that I do best. I'm gonna make it about me. Uh, <clears throat> on the day that I was born, in 1977, uh, Kendrick Fraser had already been running Skeptical Inquirer for about four months. When he died on November 7th, 2022, he had been editor of Skeptical Inquirer for 45 years. And I had been running its sibling publication, Free Inquiry, for about four months. I am before you here today in the context of actually a great deal of tragedy. Uh, last year's SciCon, when Ken was sick and couldn't be here, uh, my dad had just died a couple of weeks before. 
Uh, plus, I was, as I am now, newly inhabiting a role uh, editor of Free Inquiry, which I only have because the previous editor, Tom Flynn, had died the year before. And shortly after SciCon last year, we lost Ken. So here's me with this weird macabre thing going on with the loss of these paternal and quasi-paternal figures. And I don't, I don't really have a point about that. It's kind of weird. Um, however, I will say, just before we got started this morning, Eddie Tabash comes up to me and wants to talk about how we're leaving Free Inquiry in good hands if he were to die today. So, um, <laughs> it, it's just a lie. I'm sorry. Uh, when I started running Free Inquiry, Ken and I had been colleagues at CFI uh, for over a decade. And while we didn't know each other well, we often expressed our mutual respect and admiration Despite this vast chasm of experience between us, Ken, he immediately treated me like his equal. Now, to be clear, I would have been delighted if he had taken me aside and been like, okay, I, you do not know what you're doing. So uh, if he had like, you know, taken me aside, helped me learn how to do the job, editor explained to me a few things, uh, helped me find my footing, avoid mistakes. Instead, he allowed me to find my own place to find the magazine's voice, all on my own. He warmly offered his counsel, should I seek it? He welcomed my input on Skeptical Inquirer, and you know, perhaps most importantly, he showed that he had total faith in me. As he was about so many other things, he was excited for me. He was excited about what came next. That's our theme. Again, Ken ran Skeptical Inquirer for 45 years. Now look, for some folks who've been in one job, one leadership position for that long, one might expect that a certain malaise could set in, uh, the publication could be run on inertia, the wheels continuing to spin uh, because the staff and the writers and the interest from the audience, and somebody's been the captain of a ship for that long, just kind of point in some general direction, like everything will get taken care of, because it always has been. I would have totally understood it if after, say, year 30, he had gotten a little bored. He did not. And this is what I'm getting at. I think Ken's biggest influence on me, and I suspect on many of us, was his passion, his enthusiasm, his sincere delight in his work. Uh, Richard Dawkins uh, wrote the foreword to Ken's final book, The Shadows of Science, and to my surprise and delight, Richard quoted me in his foreword, and so now I'm going to quote myself by <laughs> quoting Richard Dawkins, okay? <laughs> Paul Fidalgo's obituary as editor of Free Inquiry, his CFO as other journal, got it exactly right, and now I'm going to be me. Uh, not only was Ken not bored or jaded, he was a beautiful writer. He assembled each new issue of Skeptical Inquirer. As he assembled each new issue, he would be bursting with pride about the wealth of knowledge and insight that he had the privilege of sharing with readers. He was so grateful that his job allowed him to keep learning fascinating new things every day, all the way to his ninth decade on Earth. Back to Richard. I couldn't say it better, so I won't. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> I couldn't say it better anyway, because I did. Uh, <laughs> Legions of luminaries, scholars, and activists have built entire careers, movements, and lives upon the foundations laid by Ken at Skeptical Inquirer. While firmly grounded in core principles, Ken Skeptical Inquirer was also a dynamic institution, learning and adapting and incorporating new ideas and expanding its areas of inquiry. Under Ken Fraser, Skeptical Inquirer showed how seemingly innocuous shams like psychics and astrology and wacky conspiracy theories and pseudoscientific alternative medicine were all of a piece, all exploiting vulnerabilities in our bullshit filters, both as a society and as individuals. Think about how bad the current information environment is today with anti-vaxxers, with QAnon, flat earthers, and young earth creationists, and homeopathy, and and on and on, and then imagine how bad it would be if not for Kendrick Fraser's skeptical inquirer. And I submit that what has made skeptical inquirer into a cultural force was Ken's joy, his love. 
In Shadows of Science, he concludes, quote, we have the capacity to create the kind of world we want. I envision one in which the ideals of democracy resound to the benefit of all, where learning, knowledge, and scientific discovery are supported and cherished, where pseudoscience and misinformation in all their forms are quickly identified and countered, where the impulses of anti-science gain no traction, where, when the world is improving, as the data show, we can appreciate that fact, and where, in those times and places where it is not, we can do what's needed to make it better. Now, I found that quote in Stephen Hupp's interview with Ruth Frazier, and I cribbed it for this presentation. <laughs> now, you may have heard that Stephen, is he, I haven't seen him, is he here? Yeah. Okay, there he is, okay, I apologize in advance. Um, <clears throat> is Skeptical Inquirer's awesome new editor? Now, let's make it about me again. Um, <laughs> Stephen got the job immediately after his appearance on Skeptical Inquirer Presents, our web series, uh, that I hosted. Uh, I had never met or interacted with Stephen uh, at, before at the time, and I was not involved in any way in the search for a new SI editor. So I had no idea that he was even in the running, but after our Zoom-based meeting and seeing his presentation, I definitely thought, okay, this guy is pretty cool, and he's pretty funny, so I hope he sticks around. <laughs> now that I've seen him on stage, in person, I don't know. Uh, I mean, he is, he's like really funny, and that's supposed to be my thing, Stephen. Um, you know, like Tom Flynn was the funny editor before, he tried to be the funny editor before, uh, and like that's sort of my gig, so you know. <laughs> Stay in your lane, you know what I'm saying. Uh, Anyway, now, as editor of SI, Stephen had the good sense to include the aforementioned interview with Ruth Frazier. Ruth is so cool. I am so glad she's here. Uh, she told me it was okay to be funny today. Uh, in fact, she more or less insisted upon it, um, which, of course, uh, puts a lot more pressure on me. So, Stephen, please, just keep in mind how hard I am working right now. Uh, I'm trying to crawl out from under your shadow. Okay. Uh, anyway, in her interview with Stephen, she talked about her personal mission statement. She said it was to make a difference by helping others make a difference. Not just helping others, but working with them to do their own life's work. She said, community organizing for me means asking people what they want and working with them to achieve their own goals. So she and Ken obviously had a lot in common. Like Ruth, Ken organized the community of really smart people with really big ideas and made them better, more effective. He helped these writers and thinkers and activists and scientists whose words he curated and refined for the pages of Skeptical Inquirer, and in so doing, he made the world Oh, and one more tidbit from Stephen's interview with Ruth. She said, one of our first dates was to listen to the sounds of Jupiter from a science lab Ken heard about. That is so adorable, I'm gonna just look. <laughs> anyway, uh, Ken's love, his humanist impulse, was not reserved for members of his own tribe. I never witnessed Ken express any derision toward those who had been misled into denying scientific reality, or anger at those who chose to close their minds to the wonders of this universe for ideological reasons. Rather, I think he saw willful or imposed ignorance as a tragedy to be prevented, or all else failing, a loss to be grieved. His skepticism was clearly grounded in his humanist moral conviction that everyone should have the opportunity to be enriched with knowledge, to be motivated by questions, to be free to express it all. And this is part of why I talk about secular humanism as grounded in skepticism. You begin with skepticism, how to think about things, learning to see the world as it truly is, using the best tools at our disposal at any given time, and acknowledging the limits of our understanding. With that as our foundation, we then have to decide what to do, how to live. And that, I submit, is determined by our values. For secular humanism, it's holding as self-evident that every individual human being deserves the freedom to think, speak, 
inquire, make mistakes, and become their best selves. Skepticism sets the stage for humanism, but it's not as simple as a one leading to the other in a straight line. Because to engage in skepticism is to embark on a very humanist project. Humanism sets the stage for skepticism. So look, don't tell anybody I said this, but skepticism and humanism are really the same project expressed in different ways. I said it. The real point is that my publication, Free Inquiry, exists on the shoulders of Kendrick Fraser's skeptical inquiry. Grounded in skepticism, we ask, now what? And because we got our tools for thinking from Ken's skeptical inquiry, we can then tap into our humanism to start exploring those answers. Ken once told us, I've never had a dull moment in all these years and decades. It's amazing! To talk to Ken about his job was to talk to a man who could hardly believe his good fortune. For me, the best thing about SciCon is the speakers who wear their passion for their work on their sleeve. The ones who are clearly driven to make a difference and are just so excited to share what they've been learning with the rest of us. This year's and last year's SciCons, they just were not the same without Ken. I know he would have loved them both. And had he been here, I hope that he would have been able to know that so much of the joy and determination on display was a direct result of his own. I hope we can keep carrying that with us. We don't have Ken anymore to cheer us on, but we'll always be able to follow his example. There's so much work to do, there's so many things to learn, and so many people to share ideas with. What's not to be excited about? Just before he died, Ken wrote, I have lived a fortunate life. My heart is full of gratitude. The universe is so big, and no single lifetime could ever be enough to take it all in. So we grieve that Ken is no longer in this universe with us. Our hearts are full of gratitude that he was. So it's in that spirit of gratitude for his nearly half century as editor of Skeptical Inquirer, for his inspiration, his wisdom, his friendship, for his incomparable legacy on behalf of science, reason, and skepticism, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry bestows this year's Paulus Prize in Critical Thinking to Kendrick Fraser, and to accept the award on his behalf, please welcome Ruth Fraser. Scientific and uh, journalistic 
uh, training came from Columbia University as one of the early science journalists. He then went to the uh, National Academy of Sciences where he was exposed to some of the top minds in the field. And from that, Ken found a wonderful place to take the best of the ideas and make them understandable <clears throat> to someone like me. <laughs> I am pleased to be here with our son, Christopher Kendrick Frazier. Stand up and take a bow, Chris. You've grown up with this guy. <laughs> Ken has left a legacy of two children, and we have seven grandchildren. Between the two of us, we traveled all seven continents, because Ken went to Antarctica and I worked in Latin America. So you could see that our world view also was pretty global. Um, Ken died of acute myeloid leukemia just about exactly one year ago, and he was supposed to be at this conference, and he was supposed to be presenting an award to Neil uh, DeGrasse Tyson, who sent Ken a text as Ken was the first day in the hospital, saying, that's a lousy way to get out of being at a conference, Frazier. <laughs> and I can assure you, this is a group that won't be saying a prayer for you. <laughs> but we will send a shout out. I think no one, including my son and myself, realized quite how seriously ill he was. And one day, the head of oncology for the University of New Mexico hospital he was in came in, and I called her Dr. Debbie Downer, because every time she came in, she had more news that wasn't wonderful. She came in this time, and her fists were clenched. No residents behind her has usually followed her in. White coat, clenched fists, and she said, Ken, this leukemia was caused by the chemo and radiation you had 20 years ago. 20 years ago, Ken was given 10 months to live with a second bout of colorectal cancer. He became the poster child for all of colorectomy. Sorry, men, but Ken would be the first to tell you. 20 years ago, he was given 10 months to live. And with radiation, and chemo at that time, his response to Dr. Debbie Downer was, God, and she unclenched a bit. And she said, good, and Ken said, I've had a glorious 20 years. I've accomplished everything I wanted to do. I've got to see my children marry, have, give us grandchildren. I've had a perfect 20 years. And then she said, and it's not genetic. And with that, Ken got tears in his eyes because he said, I've given my family enough. So that was Ken Frazier. On the first day in the hospital, he wrote the last column that Paul so beautifully quoted from. You know, I like to think he died in about three weeks from that time, acute myeloid. Uh, leukemia, as Neil deGrasse Tyson told him, anything that has acute in front of it is usually not good. <laughs> that was truly true of this. But, you know, you think of the expression, he died with his boots on. Ken died with his laptop near, and he finished the book that is really a love letter to science. He wrote on the first day in the hospital the most beautiful column I think that he'd ever done saying goodbye in the Skeptical Inquirer. And it was so subtle, I'm not sure people realized that he was dying because he also really said the rise of skepticism is terrific. He had really felt that you all and what you bring and what you take away from these kinds of conferences and the magazine and all of your associations has done so much as a movement that Ken was part of at the beginning. So it is with the greatest pleasure and pride that we accept this last posthumous award for our family, for Ken, and for you all to go away feeling you're part of something really, really, not only important, but vital, and perhaps more vital now than it's ever been. And Ken, the absolute optimist 
was so uh, enamored with Steven Pinker's book of enlightenment and the, the other books that talk about how things really globally have gotten better and why it means we must be even more vigilant than ever before to keep the crap out. <laughs> Thank you so much.